said to myself when I got done, I said, well, when I got about halfway through it, I said, I said, man, what's up with all the demons? It, it's like the author was obsessed with stories about demonic possession. Same thing with Matthew and Luke. They're not much better. Jesus believed in a God of goodness and justice, a stern but ultimately loving parental figure, and he was totally convinced that this God would have to intervene and rescue the people in order to restore that goodness and justice. Things were so bad that God himself would be compelled by his own essential justice and goodness to fix things. When the Gospel of Mark is being written down, there were people still around who had been alive when Jesus walked the earth. So there was still hope when that Gospel was being written that it would come to pass, that God would establish his kingdom on earth in the way that Jesus said it would happen within their lifetime. There was supposed to be some violent retribution involved, which would not be unwelcome to a people who had been oppressed in those days. The oppressors would be punished, and uh, ultimately the, the, the good guys were going to win. Now, 40 to 45 years later, after Mark was written, we get to the Gospel of John. 40 years. Think about that. That's a long time, especially when lifespans were much shorter than they are today. By the time we get to John, there really wasn't anyone left who had been alive when Jesus walked the earth. Very few people. What was supposed to have happened didn't. It didn't pan out the way he said, and that generation was fast disappearing. Back with Mark, the idea was that things were so bad they couldn't get any worse. When we get to the time of John, around 100 A.D., conditions were not only worse, they were unthinkable. Because in the year 70, the Roman army sacked the city of uh, Jerusalem, and they destroyed the temple. So much for the kingdom of heaven, right? It was over. The dream was dead. By the time John's gospel was written down, it looked like the principalities and powers had won. That might explain why the author of John was having a completely different experience of what Jesus had been all about compared to the other three gospels. By the time we get to John, the demons are gone. Hardly any references to any demonic possession. In fact, the only reference to demons in John is people calling Jesus a demon, saying that he is a demon because he's saying outlandish things about love and peace and forgiveness and things like that. The demons are gone. There's no talk about God and an army of angels or a lake of fire. Nobody's coming along to set up a kingdom or anything like that. In Mark, the last words of Jesus are, My God, why have you forsaken me? Those are the words of someone who is expecting a different ending, don't you think? Those are the words of someone uh, for whom the story didn't go the way it was supposed to go. You get to John, it's a whole different situation. In his last words in John, Jesus tells John, take care of my mother. Then he says, I thirst. He asks for something to drink. And then he says, it is finished. It is finished. Words that indicate Completion. That's a story that had gone according to plan. Here's something else that's different that we see in the Gospel of John that's different from all the others. The word love. The word love appears twice as many times as in any other Gospel. They double down on the word love in that Gospel. There's a definite shift in consciousness taking place. Jesus had gone from being a rescuing Messiah and a prophet of the end times to something else. John's a whole different story. An entirely different experience of the life and teachings of Jesus. John is one of the two Gospels where there is no birth story. If all we had were the Gospels of Mark and John, we'd have no Christmas. Think about that. No Christmas story there. You find those in, uh, in uh, uh, Luke, Luke and Matthew. Mark begins with the baptism of Jesus, which is where we get that voice from heaven that says, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew and Luke, it's like they're trying to one-up Mark, right? 
they're going to take it back farther. They're going to go all the way back to the time of his birth to show that Jesus was divine, the Son of God, as of the time of his birth and even conception. And then we get to John, and John's like trying to one-up all three of them. John takes it to a whole nother level. Here's the opening passage, the very first words in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. It's not a birth story, is it? That's some kind of a cosmic, infinite, eternal Christ story. And it was originally written in Greek. Now this is interesting because you see that word up there. In the beginning was the word, right? The word in Greek that gets translated as word is this one here, logos. Logos. They kind of blew it, right? I mean, they missed some of the deep and rich meaning that this, that this word carries with it. It means a whole lot more than just word. Uh, there's a lot of important meaning that gets lost in translation here. Logos was this technical term in ancient Greek philosophy. It could mean the act of reason pervading and animating the universe. It can mean spiritual principle or law. And when you get to uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the Jewish scholars who were influenced by the Greeks, even the Jewish people, just before the time of Jesus, came to regard the word logos as meaning wisdom personified or God as creative principle. Those kind of things are, are going on. And this all came to us through the, the Greek Stoic philosophers. 300 years before the Jesus and the Gospel of John came along, the Greek philosophers were using this word to refer to active reason, universal principle, spiritual principle or law. Isn't that amazing? If the author of John had really, really wanted to use word in the grammatical sense, like a word on a page or a word in a dictionary, he would have said Lexus. Lexus, not the car, but Lexus, L-E-X-I-S. <laughs> Lexus meaning word. Logos means something different, which means that he was going for something deeper, something much deeper. Again, a different experience. The author of John was living within an entire community that had a different remembered experience of Jesus than we see in the other Gospels. They experienced the life of Jesus as an expression of Logos, as an expression of the, the universal creative principle or wisdom personified. Why? Why was that? Was it, was it just because Jesus was a, a really good guy who did nice things? I mean, you know, what a, what a stand-up guy to change all that water into wine at that wedding that time. Everybody run out of wine, Jesus comes along, changes water into What a great guy. What a great guy. Or because he, he talked about love all the time. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's all part of it. But their whole world had been torn apart when Jerusalem was sacked and their holy temple was destroyed. And here comes Jesus in the face of that total disaster. And he says that I'm going to give you a new commandment. He says that he wants them to very simply love one another. This is my new commandment. To love one another as I have loved you. That's how you respond to oppression and injustice and persecution. That's what you do when you've lost everything. Love one another. Instead of invoking divine intervention and violent retribution, you rely on principle. You focus on the logos that brings all manifestation into existence. You learn how to treat everyone as if they were part of your extended family. That's what's going on. In order for these ideas to get into writing the way they did in John, this means that they must have been working Somewhere in the world, somewhere in the first century world, there was a group of people, a community, who decided to try to live the teachings of Jesus as they had learned them and as they experienced them. And that place was probably 
in the area of Ephesus, which was a part of ancient Greece in those days. The interesting thing about Ephesus is that it also happened to be the home of the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who first used the term Logos back in 500 BC. So it's really no surprise that this word and this concept becomes a central feature of the gospel that we now call John. Well, I, I want to thank you all this morning for um, bravely following me down the rabbit hole here. <laughs> uh, maybe a bit too much history, maybe a bit too much academic stuff here, but it's important. It's really important because it shows that what we say about the Bible in general, and certainly the Gospels, about how they can map out a transformation in human consciousness. That's what was going on. In just 45 years, we go from the demon-haunted world of Mark to the community of John based on wisdom, unconditional love, principle, this divine logos. It's an amazing transformation. It really happened, and it makes me wonder, how come we're still not making it work today? <laughs> Things seemed to be going well for a couple of hundred years, and then it sort of fell apart, didn't it? It kind of fell apart. And we'll talk more about that next week. We'll talk about what happened and, and, and how we can salvage, or maybe I should say resurrect, what's left of that message. <laughs> See you then.